Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine, after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Well, good morning, Shoreline. We are in week two of our Miraculous series, where we're looking uh, throughout the Gospel of John at some of Jesus' miracles as recounted in the Gospel of John. And today we're actually looking at the first of those miracles, and that is when Jesus changes water into wine, or what I call a hopeless situation and a heavenly solution. Amen? Amen. And so you think about that, those words, hopeless situation. Anybody ever been in one of those hopeless situations? Yeah, for me, I don't have to think too far. Well, actually, it is pretty far, because 1982, that's a long time ago, I was a high school senior in Minnesota. And so my buddies and I, we couldn't really afford to go anywhere warm for spring break. So what do you do in Minnesota if you don't have money to go anywhere warm for spring break? You take your buddies, 1969, Ford Galaxy 500, and you go for a spin on the lake. That's right. For some of you, I know it's completely culturally foreign, but yes, in places like Minnesota, it is cold enough, long enough, and the ice gets thick enough that you can actually drive a vehicle on it. And so my buddies and I, there we were. We were driving on the lake, and we were having a great time. You know, think about it, high school seniors, and we're tooling across the lake. We're going 30, 40 miles an hour, and just as we get into this nice, smooth spot, we would do what? We would hit the brakes. We'd turn hard right, and boy, we would spin and spin and spin and spin, right? It was sort of like, you know, Tinkerbell's teacups at Disneyland for high school seniors in Minnesota, right? And we had a great time. We had a great time. Well, we looked across the lake, and we realized, we're like, hey, there's another part of the lake over there. But in between that side of the lake, there was this thing called a sandbar. Now, we all knew the sandbar was there, and we all said, well, you know, it's a sandbar. We know that the, the water's a little shallower there, and of course, the ice will be frozen there for sure, right? That's exactly right. It's a fatal assumption, right? Fatal assumption, because why is it a sandbar? It's because the soil and the sediment and the sand keep shifting because there's water coming in or water going out. So guess what that makes the ice there? Not frozen solid. And so there we were. We were barreling. We were just barreling for that sandbar. And we hit that sandbar probably going 30, 40 miles an hour. And what do you think happened? No, absolutely nothing. I'm just kidding. The ice exploded, as you can imagine. And that 1969 Ford Galaxy 500 became a Trident submarine, right? And she just started nosing into the water. Praise God, the back wheels got hung up on the sandbar, and we didn't make it all the way in. But for about the next two minutes, as the water is pouring in, this is freezing lake water, pouring in all around us, filling up the front part. My buddies and I, somehow we imagined, we, we, we got to the back seat, out the back seat. Praise God, we had rolled down windows because we actually rolled down a window. We climbed out the window, onto the roof, onto the trunk, and from there we leapt onto the ice and landed. And there we stood, soaking wet completely in 20-degree weather. And I'm reminded of like hypothermia, right? The reality, the dangerous situation, hypothermia setting in. But there we stood and we looked at my buddy's car stuck in the ice. Like, how are we going to explain this to our parents? <laughs> that, folks, is a picture of hopelessness and despair, if I ever heard and seen one, right? <laughs> and praise God that at some point we decide, well, you know, we're going we're gonna to walk across the lake. But before we did that, there was this noise behind us. And we heard this turn around, and there was this older man. And he'd come out from his ice, ice house, and he'd heard the ruckus. And, 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 and this is what he said. He offered us these great words of encouragement and comfort. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. He says that's, I have to paraphrase this because I'm a pastor, all right? That's one heck of a mess you've gotten yourself into. 
Well, we actually ended up getting out, not with his help, but we ended up walking across the lake to another buddy's, and his dad had a tractor, a very long tow cable, and we pulled that vehicle out. And so I think about that hopeless situation. I want to take you back to another hopeless situation. About 2,000 years ago, I want to take you to a place called Cana of Galilee. And at this time and at this place, we find another hopeless situation. And why is it hopeless? Because the wine has run out. So if you've got your Bibles or you've got your app, if you'd open that up to John chapter 2, we're going to be reading in John chapter 2 today. And so John 2, verses 1 through 3, we read, On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Now, I want to unpack these verses a little bit because it's so culturally rich that we need to understand. So I want to spend a little time and rest here in these verses. And so we read in these verses that there's a wedding in Cana. And Cana, for some of you might recall, Cana was just a small, tiny, little agricultural village. It was located about 15 miles north of Nazareth, which, of course, is where Jesus grew up. And Cana was a small but close-knit community and where, where friends and families were highly valued. Anybody here grow up in a community like that? Yeah, raise your hand. I mean, that's something to be, yeah, it's great, where you know everybody, and everybody knows you, and everybody knows your business, right? Yeah, so one of those types of communities, small. And we realize, and we read here, that there's a, there's a wedding going on, right? There's a wedding ceremony, and there is a wedding feast. And at this point, the wedding is a marriage ceremony, of course. We know that it's between a man and a woman. And in this case, there's a banquet that followed it. And that this banquet, believe it or not, in Jewish culture, in first century Jewish culture, it could last for up to a week, an entire week. And so in this tiny little close-knit cana, a wedding and the banquet that followed, it's a big deal, right? It's a big deal. And we know that on the invite list that everybody from the local communities and in the village of Cana, that they all would come. And we read here that Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is on the invite list. And so is Jesus and his disciples. And so we read, we realize that there's this major dilemma that's unfolding, right? We got us a big problem in small Cana. And that problem is because the wine's run out. And some of you are like, well, it's no big deal, right? Just hop on down to the local Cana grocery and pick up some more wine, right? That's not an option, right? We know that. Or maybe you just substitute water instead of the wine, right? Okay, I mean, we'll just drink water instead. But see, in first century Jewish culture, running out of wine during the wedding feast had some major negative implications, both socially and symbolically. See, the importance of wine in that culture, in that first century Jewish culture, and I want to be clear, I'm not talking about 21st century American culture, first century Jewish culture, that running out of wine had some major implications. See, wine was symbolic of many things. One of those was God's blessing. God's blessing on the nation of Israel, God's blessing on his people was often associated with the fruit of the vine or wine. And we read in Deuteronomy 7.13, we read that it says, he, and this is God, he will love you and bless you and increase your numbers. He will bless the fruit of your womb, the crops of your land, your grain, new wine, and olive oil, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. So God's blessing was associated with the presence of wine. And also we know that wine was also the Jewish symbol, both religiously and culturally, for the presence of joy. And so there's this great commentator, and he wrote, to run out of wine would almost have been the equivalent of admitting that neither the guests nor the bridegroom, and though the bride and the groom were happy. Do you get that? So it would have been admitting that neither the guests nor the bride and the groom were happy. So can you imagine a more dismal, <laughs> symbolic statement with which to launch into your marriage, right? A joyless, unhappy life together without God's blessing. And we also know that running out of wine had some social implications as well. And so one of the commentators said, to fail in providing adequately for the guests would involve social disgrace. 
In the closely knit communities of Jesus' day, such an error would never be forgotten and would haunt the newly married couple all of their lives. You hear that? It would haunt this newly married couple all of their lives. A scandalous moment. Truly, truly hopeless situation. So who had failed? I mean, who was responsible? How many of you, raise your hands, how many of you would say it was the father of the bride, as it always is, right? Raise your hand, I'm gonna say father of the bride. Only a few hands, okay. So then whose fault was it? It was the bridegroom. Do you believe it or not, in first century Jewish culture, the bridegroom was responsible for the food and all of the wine that was at the wedding feast. You see, there were actually two ceremonies that occurred in marriage. The first of those ceremonies would have occurred about a year prior to the wedding, and that would be their betrothal ceremony. That's where the young couple would come together, and they would be betrothed to marriage. It would be a legally binding agreement, and then over the next year, this bridegroom, he would have an opportunity to prove that he was a good provider for his new bride. And so things like he would, he would begin to work hard and, and save and prepare for the opportunity when his family, when his, he would have that marriage ceremony, and that's what it would take place. There would be a marriage ceremony, the consummation of the marriage, and the feast that would follow. And so he had a year to prepare for that. To include, he actually, he and his father would build an addition onto his father and his mother's home. All you brides out there, you're going, right? All these ladies who got married, you know, think about it. You'd be moving in with your in-laws. Well, anyways, in Jewish culture, that's what it was. And so he was preparing. And also, he had to prepare and plan for all of the necessities for the banquet, to include the food and the wine. So he had a year to prepare to prove to everyone that he was a good provider. And what had happened? He'd failed. He'd failed for whatever reason to understand and estimate the amount of wine. And so because the wine had run out, he would know that he had failed. And he would have to carry this disgrace for the rest of his life. His bride would be shamed. He and his new bride would be scorned. His family would be ostracized and the village and the towns could be torn apart by this scandalous moment for which he was responsible for. I mean, you can almost hear the voices around him, right? Saying, that's one heck of a mess you got yourself into. <laughs> Hopeless and helpless. That's what would have described him, his situation, unless there was someone present who could remedy the situation and solve this dilemma. And we're gonna meet him in a moment. And so in verse three, we read that Jesus' mother, Mary, she's learned of the shortfall. And so she does what she's always done. She goes to someone who always gives her the right answer, someone who's always given her the best solution. She goes to YouTube, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> she goes to Jesus. I mean, think about it. Why would she go anywhere else, right? She goes to Jesus. Now, we're not really sure what she was expecting Jesus to do. Maybe she was expecting this grand and glorious, you know, Jesus to do something grand and glorious, but we don't know that. And so what we see is Jesus' response. How would he respond? And we see an honoring son, an honoring son, the watershed moment that charts a new course for all eternity in verses four and five, we read, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now Jesus responds, that's a really curious way, right? To respond to your mother, isn't it? But I want you to be very careful here. He didn't say yes, mother. He used the term woman. Now, we have to be careful we don't take our cultural lens and put on top of that. Woman, the term woman, was not derogatory and it certainly wasn't disrespectful because Jesus would have never violated the fifth commandment, which says, honor your father and... So Jesus wasn't disrespecting Mary. The term actually translates better as we might use the term ma'am today. It shows respect and honor, but it's certainly not endearing the way that you would expect a son maybe to address his mother, right? And then you couple that with Jesus' response that says, why do you involve me? Which literally means, what is there between you and me? 
And it's a phrase that really emphasizes distance. It's distancing from the speaker and the addressed person. And so why this response? And as I've studied this text, I really see there's really a twofold purpose. One is Jesus was really emphasizing that there's a different relationship now with Mary. And then I think the second part of that is Jesus was respectfully reminding his mother of a purpose that's greater than the immediate concern or what she might have been expecting here. In Jesus' statement, my hour has not yet come, of course, is referencing the time when he would ultimately fulfill the destiny for which he came, the time of his sacrificial death on the cross, where he would pay the price of sin for all mankind for all time. And so these two statements then, they communicated this significant shift, this watershed moment, this turning point in Jesus' public ministry and in his life where he would create distance from obedience and caring for his earthly mother's needs in order that he could faithfully, humbly, and completely obey his heavenly Father's will. Amen? He's perfectly balanced, honoring his earthly mother while honoring the will of his heavenly Father. And so Mary's recognition and her direction to the servants affirms this because we see that Mary yields to Jesus, not the other way around. And that's important, right? And she says, do whatever he, she's talking about Jesus, tells you to the servants. And those are great words, I think, for us to live by, right? So whatever Jesus tells us to do, we should do it, right? And so we still have this problem though, right? We still have this dilemma, and so we see now Jesus. We see Jesus humbly and compassionately stepping in without great fanfare and solving this dilemma. And he offers a heavenly solution. The creator himself, he steps in and he changes water into wine. And so we continue in verse six and we read, nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. You see, we see this beautiful picture of Jesus, the faithful son, the loyal friend. We see him step into this hopeless situation and then he displays his glory as the son of God and creator God. We see Jesus, the one who existed outside of space, eternally one with God the Father and God the Spirit and the one who created space, the universe and the cosmos. We see Jesus, the one whose radiance outshines the sun, the one who actually created the sun in all of its brilliance, and the one who set it into place. We see Jesus, the one who created the heavens and the earth, and he came to earth fully God and fully man to freely offer his life as a ransom for the world that he created. We see Jesus, the one who separated. He separated the water from the sky and earth, who drew the boundaries of the ocean waters, who walked on those same waters. And at his very word, he calmed the raging seas that he had created. We see Jesus as the one who created the rivers, the streams, and these amazing waterfalls for us to gaze upon. Jesus, the one who created the beauty and uniqueness of animals and plants, which draw their life from the water that he created and he provides. And in the one, Jesus, at the apex of creation, he created man and woman in his image, commanding them to care for his creation and within his perfect plan for marriage to be fruitful and multiply. Jesus, the creator and sustainer. And so when he steps into this situation, he does what only he can do. He creates 
what is exactly needed. He creates new wine. So for man, of course, for us, men and women, this would be impossible, right? Because what are the two ingredients that we need for wine? We need fruit of the vine and time. <laughs> a lot of it, right? We need a lot of grapes and a lot of time. But think about this. But for Jesus, the one who existed before and outside of time, and the one who had created those very grapes, it was not only possible, but it was also practical. It was practical for Jesus because he was able to step in. He met the need. He redeemed the, the situation. He solved the problem, and his solution brought the highest satisfaction. The new wine exceeds all expectations and brings renewed joy. And we read in verse nine, it says, then he, of course, this is the master of the banquet, called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. I mean, the wine that Jesus made, it wasn't just any old wine, it was the best wine. And why would it not be? This is wine made by the hands of the creator himself, amen? With Jesus' divine intervention, the joy was restored and the celebration could continue. And of course, who gets the credit? The bridegroom, right? He goes from zero to hero because of Jesus stepping into the situation. And so as we read this amazing story, we see the personal and practical aspects of Jesus' ministry, and we also see a miraculous message for us all, for all time. We read in verse 11, it says, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. And that word signs, the Greek word is semeon, and this is what it translates. It means an unusual occurrence transcending the common course of nature. And it means of miracles and wonders by which God authenticates men that he has sent. And so when we see Jesus' signs in this miracle then, it's pointing us to both his person as God himself, the creator of God, the one who transcends nature and its laws, and it also appoints us to his works as a seal of God's approval and for us, each of us then, to know and we believe in him. So then what is significant or significant, right, about this miracle, about Jesus choosing to reveal his glory of at all places a wedding feast by creating new wine? Well, I think this miracle, it's like a flashing sign on the side of the road, and it's declaring these three eternal truths for us. Salvation has come. Our Savior is near, new life available. Salvation has come. In revealing his glory by creating new wine, Jesus actually was fulfilling prophecies, prophecies that had been told centuries before of a Messiah, of a king, the anointed one of God that would come, and when he came, he was gonna deliver his people and he was gonna rescue them from the world, and the oppression of the enemy. We read in Joel 3.18, one of those prophets, and he writes, in that day the mountains will drip new wine and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Acacias. And Amos, another prophet, he writes in Amos 9, 13, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. Note that the Messiah's presence was gonna be marked by the presence of new wine. And so in Jesus' first miracle, it announces the same. The Messiah has come to save his people. And we also see the other side. Our Savior is near. And so when Jesus 
stepping into this hopeless situation at a wedding feast, Jesus is proclaiming to us that he is not a God that is distant, and he will not be a God that is distant. He will not stand back and watch the people he came to save fall and fail. He's not going to stand there and say, that's one heck of a mess you've gotten yourself into. He's the one that stepped in. He stepped into the messiness and the brokenness of humanity. He's the one that ultimately steps into the most hopeless of all situations, our eternal separation for God, from God because of our sinfulness. And Jesus steps in. And with this miracle, he was effectively setting the course where he would go to the cross. And on the cross, he would pay the price for the penalty of our sin so that we could be redeemed and restored in a relationship with our heavenly father, amen? And we also read that this is new life available. The sign flashes new life available. This miracle is also a contrast for us. It's a contrast between the pitfalls and shortfalls of a life spent without Jesus Pursuing things that may appear to be good. Pursuing things that eventually, like those vats of old wine, they lead to emptiness, to brokenness, and unfulfillment. And because he is both creator and sustainer, Jesus has the power to not only make all things new, like he did with the wine, he has the power to make all lives new. And all it requires on our part is to believe in him, and accept his free gift of grace. So as we look at this miracle, now we say, well, how does this miracle apply to our lives today? How does it apply? Well, first, I think we know that Jesus is still renewing and transforming lives today, including yours and including mine. And Jesus is ready to step into the messiest and the most hopeless situations in our lives and he's not going to stand back and say, that's a heck of a mess you've gotten yourself into. I mean, think about your situation before. Some of you don't yet know Jesus Christ. You have not yet placed your faith in him. But many of you in this room have. Do you remember your life before Jesus stepped into your life, before someone revealed to you, they revealed the story of Jesus, and you placed your faith in Jesus? Look at your life back then, and now look at your life now. Jesus has brought you comfort. He has brought you fulfillment. He has brought you purpose. And he's brought you peace. And guess what? He's still not done with us yet, is he? He's still transforming us. We are his works in progress for him to display his glory and for us to share his story with a world that desperately needs to know the hope that they can have in Jesus alone. And second, I think we know that Jesus still promises the only life that is truly satisfy, satisfying, excuse me, and overflowing with goodness. Satisfying, the only life. See, Jesus is the only source of true satisfaction because he is the ultimate source of all that is good. And so for those of you who believe in Jesus, for those of us who've placed our faith in Jesus, we know that like the new wine, we experience new life, a life that's abundant, a life that is satisfying down to the depths of our soul. And for those of you that might be here this morning who've yet to place your faith in Jesus, hear his words from John 10.10, 10, what he offers you as well. Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. He offers you a full, satisfying life. And third, we know that Jesus' presence alone still brings joy everlasting. It's that, that delight of mind, that joy that we have, knowing whose we are in Christ. Our circumstances don't define us. We can have joy even in the most difficult of all circumstances because we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, and that's where we plant our anchor. Our identity is in Jesus Christ. So we can have joy 
the joy that Psalm 16, the psalmist talks about, the joy of his presence. Because when we place our faith in him, he indwells, he takes up residence in us. The Holy Spirit fills us with the joy of Jesus' presence. And finally, we have Jesus. He still provides us hope no matter what we are facing. Nothing's beyond his ability to restore, to repair, to redeem. Nothing. If it's within his sovereign will and his sovereign timing and within his purpose, he will do it. And so when we cry out to him, he doesn't stand back and say, that's a heck of a mess you've gotten yourself into. No, Jesus comes close to us. He comes, he provides comfort. He gives us strength when we need strength. He gives us resilience to get back up. He gives us hope because ultimately our hope is not in our situation, but it's in him. His promise to give us that hope, the eternal hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Jesus, our mighty savior, our rescuer, our redeemer, our closest friend, the hope of the world, and the one that makes all things new. And so I'm gonna invite the band back up here and we're gonna sing a, a closing song, a response song, if you will. And I, I just wanna encourage you today to make this song your prayer. So maybe this morning you, you're here and you just want to rejoice and say, thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done for me. You've created new life. You've given me a new life and you've filled me with the eternal joy, the hope, the comfort, the peace of your presence. Let that be your prayer, amen? But for some of you today, you might say, Pastor Sean, to be completely honest, I've given up hope. Maybe it's hope for a situation you're facing Maybe it's hope for a loved one. Maybe you've been praying for them, praying with them, and it just seems like there's no hope in sight. And today, this might be a prayer of supplication where you might ask Jesus, Jesus, give me the hope. Remind me of the hope that you have in you. Maybe today you would say that, Pastor Sean, I've been actually seeking something other than the goodness and the satisfaction of a life spent living for Jesus. So today, maybe it's a prayer that you would surrender that and you would say, Jesus, I commit my life to follow you and seek you and you alone for all of the days of my life. Maybe today you'd say, Pastor Sean, my joy meter is completely tapped out. I've got no joy. My joy is waning. So maybe your prayer is, Jesus, today, restore me with the joy of your presence. And lastly, maybe today, you just need renewal. Maybe you need some spiritual restoration. Maybe today has been a reminder of the goodness and the greatness of Jesus Christ and what he wants to do in our lives and through our lives. Lord Jesus, we pray that as we continue our time of worship together, that now, Lord, our hearts are completely open to you and the work that you want to do through the power of your Holy Spirit. Speak to us in this time. We pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen.